your safe zone. Um, what's your opinion on how all these seashells got on top of the tallest mountains all over the world? Uh, did they evolve there, or maybe was there some great flood? Well, I spent a part of my time uh, in Nebraska, and their state capital is made of some really cool rock. Uh, like they've got um, a little mosaic that follows the evolution of life um, using like really cool rock that's got all those seashells in it. That's how much I know about uh, those rocks and seashells. Um, but I would say that to me it makes sense that um, with plate tectonics and how things have changed over time, the things that used to be covered in water are now no longer covered in water. So that the earth was at one time maybe totally encompassed with water? No, I would say that the land was differentially arranged and mountaintops from plate tectonics and that sort of thing. This is that's those, as far as I go. This is one of those things that, that I think creationists probably should not say because uh, your mainstream creation researchers believe in plate tectonics and, and see the evidence of that, that mountains have been hoisted up from the bottoms of the oceans, and that's why we find seashells in the Himalayas, not because the Himalayas were, were covered with water at one time. We believe that the, the, the mountain building occurred after the flood. The mountains, we didn't have mountains of that scale at the time of Noah's flood. But what we do pr have predicted by the flood geology model is that you should have continent scale uh, deltas, continent scale deposits of rock that, that go not only across an entire continent, but have their counterparts on several other continents. We've got the St. Peter sandstone, uh, the Austin chalk, the Tapit sandstone. These things uh, outcrop all over the mainland United States and, and outcrop in England and Germany. Uh, according to the creation model, the floodwaters in Noah's flood would have washed across the continent. This is the only mechanical way to get a uniform sandstone layer that covers an entire continent. You're not going to get a river delta to do that. There's the Mississippi River Delta, and that's one of the world's biggest, and you just can't, uh, uh, can't get an entire continent covered in delta. In a shallow inland sea, well, many of these sandstone layers are not limey. They have no evidence of saltwater uh, benthic forms, uh, any, uh, in other words, uh, uh, clamshells. They do have lime cementing the, the, the uh, sometimes it's quartz instead that dissolves. So, You've got a real problem uh, in geology if you don't believe the flood model. Thank you both for being here tonight. Um, just to try to get back, I have a quick question about genetics um, and molecules. Um, I thought I'd ask something on the lines of gene expression and going back to Abby about the question about the fish in the caves and how they lose their vision and if you bring them out about how they may, um, again, be able to assume that um, ability to see over time. And so I thought it might help the audience, since I do personally a lot of research and I read a lot of the stuff that Dr. Jackson does in our work and our research about this type of gene expression and um, how sometimes it's more about how the genes are expressed and over time not so much adding in new genetic material, sure. but actually how the genes themselves are expressed, and I thought it might actually be beneficial to the audience to understand that. That was uh, one of the first things they looked at after uh, the chimpanzee, both the chimpanzee and human genomes were sequenced, because they looked at it and they were like, okay, these are basically the same, what, what exactly is making a chimpanzee a chimpanzee and a human a human? Um, and so they did a technique called a microarray, where you look at the expression, the RNA message that gets made uh, in a chimpanzee cell versus a human cell in lots of different tissues. Um, and they found that, yeah, the genes are the same, but sometimes it's the expression levels uh, that are changed, and that sometimes causes the differences. And I think they found, especially uh, in the brain, that that's where there were a lot of differences. But you would, I could find that. Well, this, is, this is what you're talking about here, the FOXP2 gene that has to do with brain development. It was Svante Pavo doing the uh, uh, Jim Genome Project, Neanderthal Genome Project, uh, said that uh, 
He reported that a gene known as FOXP2, which plays a role in language acquisition, produces a subtly different protein in humans than in chimps. Although the difference is small, just two amino acids, it's most likely significant since the alteration was strongly uh, favored by natural selection. That's evolution creeping into the story there. Uh, starting less than 200,000 years ago, there it is again, around the time when human being language took a great leap forward. But gene sequences alone do not tell the whole story. Now that's only two amino acids different. Most, most proteins are 400 or 500. That's your average protein. How many amino acids? It's only two different. Clearly, there's more going on there's a whole lot of stuff that needs to be looked at with this epigenetics. Um, there's a whole lot that needs to be looked at as, as far as what each gene does and how they affect the other genes. So we're, we've only scratched the surface and begun now that we have, uh, have these sequences and we have new uh, uh, technology to probe how genes actually work. We're finding out what we were infants you know, five years ago and uh, we just only realize we're toddling, toddling around. Uh, in that. So that opens it wide open for all of us to stand back and wonder, of course. The creationists will say, uh, what a mighty God we serve, what, a, uh, what an infinitely uh, imaginative, ingenious uh, design, which has uh, had built in safeguards to try and manage the damages that would occur in the centuries and generations to come, uh, which is why it's not perfect now, and why it's, uh, it's all weedy with a whole lot of baggage it's carrying. Uh, I, I. Um, and sometimes expression levels are different because of what I was talking about with the stolen promoters from endogenous retroviruses. There's a really cool story about how uh, humans actually gained um, a lost uh, portion of our immune system. Um, it actually accumulated some mutations that were deleterious, and a endogenous retrovirus plopped down in front of it and allowed it to regain its functionality uh, by stealing its promoter. So, again, from the evolutionary perspective, uh, a lot of the changes in gene expression, they aren't, they aren't just happening by random chance. There are mutations happening in the promoter regions that uh, change the expression levels. I guess just to clarify, that would be the big difference between the creationist side and the evolutionist side, is that they totally agree that there are changes in the genetic code, that there are definitely different ways that the genes express themselves, Creationists just say you're not ever going to get new material added in that will make the species change from one to another. And you can actually lose expression, but and you can gain it back over time, but you're still going to have the same species. You're not ever going to have something becoming something else. Just like we've actually seen in our research at the museum that I work with, where a snake put in a different environment actually lost the ability to its venom actually changed. It actually lost um, certain gene expression, and its venom changed to where it wasn't even venomous anymore. But it didn't actually gain new genetic material. It had it there all the time. It was just expressed differently. Um, well, if I could go back to uh, HIV, um, that's kind of something Michael Beakey said was that, you know, HIV is this prime evolutionary machine, and it can't make anything new. Um, but the problem is that it has. Uh, there's a different kind of HIV called HIV-2 that has a gene HIV-1 doesn't have due to a gene duplication and divergence like I talked about. And then HIV-1 has a gene that HIV-2 doesn't have. Uh, and it actually happened a while back, and we can't figure out where it came from. Um, but HIV-1 and HIV-2, some people would look at that and say, oh, they're both still viruses. That's unimpressive. But they behave in very different ways. They're different viruses. Um, so to say, oh, it's still just a snake, it didn't get anything to say, oh, it's still just a virus, um, I'd say that's a very simplistic way of looking at what things are. So gene duplication would be that gluing of two books together. Uh, actually, it would be making a Xerox copy. It's getting two copies of the same book. They subsequently um, diverge. And then afterwards, one book changes while the other one stays the same. Uh, through Maybe like smacking two candles together. <laughs>